our Easter celebration has been subdued this year. In our various ways, we've done our best to celebrate the proclamation of Christ's resurrection. But I must say, on Easter morning, the trumpet accompaniment to Jesus Christ is risen today sounded a little tinny as it came over the Zoom. Our church secretary had to creep into a locked and deserted sanctuary in order to unbury the Alleluia. We have sung hymns of joy, if not in four-part harmony, but we've also been reciting poems like the one that Amber read in chapel yesterday, for one who is exhausted, a blessing. The joy that we have been learning is not so much the joy of trumpets and bells, but the joy that, I quote from the poem, dwells far within slow time. If we follow the biblical stories about the appearances of the risen Christ, it's perhaps not so inappropriate that our joy be subdued. For these stories, I'm not entirely sure that trumpets and bells provide the right soundtrack. Think of the resurrection appearances that we've heard about in St. John's Gospel. First, to Mary Magdalene, who wept as she searched for Jesus' dead body. Or to the disciples huddled in a room behind locked doors. Or to Thomas, utterly skeptical of his companion's testimony. Yes, there's joy in these stories, but there's also raw grief, fear, and dread, amazement, and awe. Some of you have heard me say this before, but it's worth saying again, the news that someone has risen from the dead is not automatically good news. It might be terrifying news. The serial killer who turns out not to be dead after all is the stock figure of detective fiction. Now here in this story, we're not talking about a murderer, we're talking about Jesus. But let's face it, Resurrection is a really unnerving concept. As consciousness of Jesus's resurrection begins to take hold in St. John's Gospel, there is awkwardness, hesitation, skepticism, dread, perhaps even terror, as well as joy. What will the resurrected one say or do to followers who have betrayed him? Remember that most of Jesus's disciples simply dropped out of St. John's passion narrative once Jesus had been arrested. He disappeared. Peter continued to follow Jesus, but then while warming himself at a charcoal fire, explicitly denied his connection to Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times. In the reading that Nico has just read, we find that the disciples, or seven of them to be precise, have returned to Galilee and gone fishing. We are explicitly told that Jesus has already appeared to the disciples, not just once, but twice, and that our story takes place after these things. So it's a surprise to find ourselves in Galilee at the lake. Now, I know we can mitigate our surprise by pointing out that chapter 21 is a kind of editorial addition to an earlier redaction of the gospel, a kind of alternative resurrection account that has been awkwardly connected to chapter 20, and so on and so forth. But I'm going to follow the text as it has been delivered to us. In doing that, we encounter disciples who appear to have no idea of how to process everything that has happened in chapter 20, no clue how to live after Jesus' resurrection and appearances to them, including his sending them out in mission. Remember Jesus' words, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. And so they behave as if the whole Jesus thing had never happened. In chapter 21, the disciples have returned to chapter one, where they were when they first met Jesus, on the lake, fishing. You know the story from there. 
a night of fruitless toil, advice from a stranger on the beach, a great catch, recognition, it is the Lord. The awkwardness of the disciples who don't know what to say, a breakfast of fresh of fish and bread. Early Christian exegetes identified some pressing problems that required creative thought. For example, what is the meaning of the 153 fish caught in the disciples' net? St. Augustine found it very significant that 153 is a triangular number, the sum of all the integers up to 17. What does it mean for a resurrected body to eat? Does this involve digestive processes? Exegetes got quite worried here. But I am struck by other details. The disciples are standing around feeling abashed, not daring to ask the first question that comes to their minds, who are you? Perhaps they were remembering how they had run away after the arrest of Jesus. Perhaps they were burning with shame, bracing for a rebuke, dreading what the risen one would say to them. The charcoal fire that Jesus was tending is a verbal reminiscence of the charcoal fire over which Peter denied having any connection to Jesus. Is there a whiff of rebuke or threatened retribution in the smoke drifting out over the beach from that fire? But what Jesus says to his disciples is this, come and have breakfast. The risen one does nothing to shame the disciples or punish them or put them on probation. Rather, he feeds them. He reestablishes his table fellowship with them. What an incredibly gracious word this is. Now, in St. John's Gospel, we have a beautiful collection of gracious words from the risen Jesus. Words like, like, Mary, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Do not doubt, but believe. Feed my sheep. Follow me. But I think that one of the most gracious is this very human, down-to-earth word from our reading today. Come and have breakfast. <sighs> and this is where my sermon breaks down. I'm stuck. Obviously, what I am supposed to do next is invite you to break your fast, to come and eat at this, the Lord's table. And I can't do that. Can't do that. I can console myself a little bit in that I'm not alone in this. I think of Muslim friends. Right at this moment in Cairo, it's a Ramadan evening. The sun has just set. Normally, there would be tables set up in the streets with food prepared and laid out and with people making an open invitation to passersby. Da'alu, tfadalu. Come and break your fast. But that's not happening. Although I should add that people are still doing their best to distribute food to the poor. But Muslims are breaking their Ramadan fast in family groupings without that public invitation, come and have breakfast. Many of us Christians are simply fasting from the Eucharist. And the time of breaking our fast has not yet arrived. I don't know when that time will arrive. So where does that leave us? Where shall we go now with this sermon? I still find good news in this passage, even without the invitation to the meal that would seem so natural at this point. I find good news in the very earthiness of the story. There's a kind of sacramentality in that. For those of us who, while grateful for the miracle of Zoom, 
are weary of encountering one another in two-dimensional images that cannot touch, with sounds that cannot harmonize, in a medium that could simply disappear in a power cut. We can revel in this story, in the feel of this story from St. John's Gospel, the wind on the lake, or the rough ropes in the disciples' hands, or water on skin as Peter plunges into the lake, or in the smells of the story, fresh lake breezes, great piles of fish, burning charcoal, food being grilled, or in the tastes of the story as bread and fish are shared. Our faith is an embodied faith in an incarnate Lord, lived out in tackling the flesh and blood needs of the neighbor. And we will share more fully in all these embodied experiences again. I find good news in the very ordinariness of Jesus's appearance. Some person standing on the beach, tending a fire. There is no veil between Jesus and the disciples, no curtain, no blazing fire, no abyss. It's not at all like the image from our first reading today, where the elders of Israel see the God of Israel, but, as it were, through a pavement of blue stone, like sapphire or lapis lazuli. Jesus is not on the other side of some gemstone barrier. He's simply over there on the shore. He calls to his disciples and will soon be in their midst. I find good news in the odd narrative twists and turns of St. John's resurrection accounts, which resist any attempt to reduce them to a formula or to extract meaning from them through a process of abstraction. The Easter good news cannot be boiled down to a concept, a lesson, an eternal truth, something that can be memorized and tucked away to be brought out at the proper time. It is not reducible to pious sayings about how life prevails over death or how death does not have the last word, as true as those words might be. Rather, St. John's Gospel reminds us that the Easter good news has to do with the resurrection of a person, a particular individual, Jesus of Nazareth, and the promise, and it's truly a promise and not a threat, that we will meet this one. This Jesus, the one who says, come and have breakfast. So where does this leave us if we were to insert ourselves into the story from St. John's Gospel? I think that at this point in this very strange Easter season, we can imagine ourselves into the boat. The disciple whom Jesus loved has just said, it is the Lord. That is the Easter proclamation. We've heard that. We haven't made it to the shore yet. For now, we remain in our socially distanced boats and we're hungry. But Jesus is waiting for us, not to rebuke us, but to feed us. And perhaps that is enough to allow us to say, it is well with my soul. <laughs>